Good morning. Today is the 24th of June, the year 2013. I'm Harry Ziegler, volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in Palm Springs, California. As part of the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. Today we have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Captain Dan Patterson. Captain Patterson was a Top Gun Navy fighter pilot who had uh, multiple tours in Vietnam. So we're going to talk to Dan about what he did and other things during his life. Nice to have you here, Dan. Thank you, sir. To VF-92 with the famous Skank Remsen. Skank Remsen was my CO and, uh, and uh, we uh, flew Phantoms, B models. Hmm. And uh, he uh, is a good combat, a great combat leader and a good tactician. And uh, we had a good, strong squadron. Now, how much ACM were you guys getting in that? We got very little legally. Uh -huh. It was, you know, it was uh, until about 1968, people had forgotten. You know, the magic new airplanes with the radar and, and the Sparrow missile and the Sidewinders and the fact that you can see out ahead a number of miles and shoot a guy at eight, ten miles and never see him. You know, that was in theory what they sold the Navy. In actuality, what happened is when you get into North Vietnam, and in 19, 19, I was there in 65, but the real combat for me started with Skank in, in 1967. And uh, what everybody found out is, Jesus, we really ought to be do know more about dogfighting and air combat maneuvering like, like uh, Korea, like the Second World War, like the First World War, and all the basic elements and oh, by the way, you know, we're in the middle of a war, we can't really change airplanes or their configuration. So there's only one thing you can do. You can learn to fly air combat maneuvering, dogfighting with what you got. And that's why Top Gun got started. Now, how did you end up starting Top Gun? Where, where well, I made, uh, I made uh, a couple combat cruises out to Vietnam and uh, and uh, the losses were unacceptable, mainly because of political control of the war. You know, why in the hell promote a, a guy to wing commander or ship's captain, of one of those big aircraft carriers, or, or uh, uh, and each one of us had an admiral on board, you know. Why don't you let them win the war? Just tell them, go do it, and this short of, short of nuclear weapons or whatever, go win for me and let them do it. And uh, we ran into a lot of very, very, in McNamara's time, you know, Defense Secretary McNamara. He was shaking your head, yes. And uh, so anyhow, I, uh, we had been trained differently and so forth. And uh, the airplane was a remarkable airplane, but it didn't have a gun. And we found that in every circumstance, going in over the beach, we'd send a strike group in. 30 of us go in together, led by the wing commander or somebody senior, and we get in there, and here come the Air Force out of Thailand, 30, 60 of them, 105s, Phantoms, you know, uh, and you'd end up with mixed Air Force, Navy in there over Hanoi or somewhere up there and we didn't have the ability to discreetly tell who the friendlies were or who the enemy was. And all you gotta do is throw four or five or six MiGs in the air in the same area. And you and I both know, probably one of the most serious things we ever thought about flying is you will never shoot down one of your own. And uh, when you get total confusion going on up there, they shoot, I've seen as high as 30 SAMs at a strike group, and uh, you throw evasion in that, and uh, you just don't have any way of protecting yeah. the other friendlies. People are on the radio? Oh yeah, people, you know, and somebody gets hit, you know. Yeah. Somebody's hit, I'm hit, I'm heading home. 
and uh, there's, there's so much getting on. And now today they call that the merge. You get in and you merge, and guess what? The first time you see the mix, you hope you see them a half a mile, canopy to canopy, and then you fight them. Yeah. And that was what was so great about the F-14 when we finally got them. F-14 with gun, with a gun, Gatling gun, M-61 gun, a ferocious machine. And uh, But the Phantom was pretty good too. We went from two to one kill ratio. We lost 17 guys in 11 days on Enterprise in 1967. And we didn't have a gun. And uh, after Top Gun got going and we got the people back out into the fleet squadrons and the new doctrine, which I'll tell you about, hell, uh, from 1968 until the end of the war in 73, kill ratio went up to 24 to one. 24 victories for every loss. And that's the way it should be. Historically, including all air wars, First World War, Second World War, Korea, we averaged 12 to one. Never worse than 12 victories for every loss in, in air, air to air combat. And uh, why we ever forgot that, yeah. I'll never know. Well, when I went back to Hawaii from Vietnam, yeah. That was one of my major concerns. Finally, Marine pilots from Top Gun start coming through sure. the squadrons yeah. and teaching. Yep. And I, when I left Vietnam, I said, we just didn't have enough of it. No, oh, yeah. This is in 68. Yeah. And I said, we didn't just we spent too much time thinking about bombers yep. and intercepting bombers. Yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, that's a leadership issue. Somebody ought to be, and I know they're out there somewhere thinking these things, but... Uh, Do you get up to Fallon? You know? Oh, I go up. I sp spoke at a graduation up there a while back, and uh, we stay in contact with everybody. Um, that's a little sidebar. Um, are you here, would you ever speak at some of the, like, the DFC group? Oh, if sure. I do a lot. I have done a lot of that all over the country. Great. And, well, uh, I set up speakers for them a oh, bit. Yeah, yeah, be happy to do anything you want. Okay. And uh, well, let's keep on going. Yeah, sure. Um, so, Phantom, Phantom tour with Remsen, uh, and you know the moratorium on on airplanes going over North Vietnam, and pretty soon Lyndon Johnson shut it down, and then he turns it back on, and McNamara gives you explicit guidance in the in the. Uh, rules of engagement, you understand that, and you and I do, and many of the people watching this will. Uh, again, you can have rules of engagement, but make them simple and make sure none of them impede winning. Political correctness and things like that have no place in rules of engagement. And nobody should ever write rules of engagement for a military operation unless they've, unless they've been involved themselves physically in the war. And uh, I, those are things that I, I learned you know, and were here. embodied in some later work I did. So I spent a couple of months with 7th Air Force and strike plans in Saigon oh, yeah. during Tet. And we would go to Thailand and meet with the government, people who would tell us what targets oh, we yeah. could go after in Hanoi and Haiphong. Yeah. They would pick the targets for yeah, us. Yeah. And, uh, we didn't just shake your head. You, know? you probably have a lot of footage of this in your library here at the museum, but but uh, I have gone over Haiphong on the way to another target and watched the shipping sitting out there waiting for a berth to unload the uh, air to air, surface to air missiles that were going to be fired at us for the next week, 10 days. And uh, your rules of engagement would not allow us to. Uh, to, uh, even though they're laying on the dock and they're not off the third country shipping, they wouldn't allow us to get them. We we're never allowed to do that until later, very much later. With your F-4, you say you did do some air to ground with it? Oh, yeah. What would be your uh, load that you would CBUs. Take? CBUs. My favorite weapon. Yeah. Yeah. And you remember how many of them you carried? Oh, I can't remember. Yeah. Did but, you have both yeah. MERS and TERS on, on your boat? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So with, did you carry more than two drops? I always carried center lines. Always center lines. So the wing stations were loaded. 
Yeah. And the pylons were loaded. Yeah. Okay. And uh, they gave us gun pods once. Remember the Mark 11 gun pods? Oh, Jesus. Huh? Look at him shake his head. Uh, yeah, we were over in North Vietnam and we jettisoned some of them. I mean, I, and, uh, they, you're, you're mixing it up with somebody or, or the worst one is that always somebody gets shot down on the ground and the troops are advancing on whoever's trying to survive on the ground till we get a helo in to pull him out. And, uh, and all the troops are coming in and you can see them coming in and you don't have anything to shoot at them to slow them down. Yeah. But if you have a, a M61 gun and uh, that doggone Mark 11 gun pod, uh, I never had one in combat that ever worked. And I just wouldn't carry them anymore. I'd rather have two more sidewinders. We had hangers full of them. Yeah. And people worked on them all yeah. the time. And they just, yeah. you could you never knew. Yeah. Couldn't read. But in a positive sense, when I got up, when Top Gun got rolling, we went up uh, and flew a lot, and, and this will be another chapter here, but we went up and flew a lot with the Air Force at Nellis, at Air Force Fighter Weapons School. And they had a building up there with the M61 guns in them that were fit into their later version of the Phantom. And their firing rate was 97% success. Every time you went out, you would fire. It may not fire fully out, but it would fire. It was a pod? No. It was in the plane? Oh, no, yeah. In the bird? Yeah. yeah. So you're flying the air, what, was it an E? Was it yeah. an E model yeah. that, that had the gun? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, well. But it just, all we could do is shake our head because mm -hmm. I had memories of, of somebody down down that really needed help and uh, you know you can, uh, guys and guys actually shot sparrow or sparrows pretty expensive but they shoot a sparrow just to try and deter the ground troops and uh, anyhow you? let's see we were there uh, the 11 guys in 17 days wasn't all it wasn't all uh, fighters. That was air to ground losses and, and one thing or another. And uh, but the biggest problem was uh, you had to get in close in order, and we weren't trained to dogfight. And that was so apparent. And take a break. No, just go ahead. I'm, I wanted to check something. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm gonna grab a little water here. And make sure things are matching up. A break? No, I'm fine. Just keep going and save you time. And well, I guess uh, the next thing on the list of. What I wanted to ask you about Top Gun. Did you have resistance to setting that program up? Yeah, well, the actual answer was. It was a handful of people, and they were people who had been very visibly active in the fleet air defense, chasing bombers with the Phantom and so forth, or people that had been major political advocates of the, f the technology that we had in the Phantom. Uh, and, uh, and it wasn't all bad, don't get me wrong. But uh, Frank all. The war wasn't going that good in 1967, 68. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I mentioned before, two to one kill ratio. And these are, you know, I'm sure there were some Russian pilots flying against us, and but still two to one is just unacceptable. And, uh, and we were embarrassed by it. Uh, and Frank Ault, the famous Frank Ault from Skipper uh, USS Coral Sea, wrote the Ault Report and published it. And he, it was a dissertation, multi-chapter dissertation on uh, all the things that he saw that needed improving out there in the uh, fleet air arm that was fighting that war out there, carrier aviation essentially. And uh, one of them was changing the tactics with the airplanes. And, uh, and he sent it back and it went to CNO and it went down to to uh, the DCNO for air, and uh, and they endorsed it favorably. And somehow I was back in 
be F-121 after that 67 cruise. And uh, I was head of tactics. And I had some good, I had had some good dogfighting experience with my guys, even from that first squadron. Because you're flying with guys who are the masters of gunnery and, and dogfighting. Yeah. And then you run into a squadron uh, where uh, it's not tolerated. Subject yeah. to court martial. Yeah, We've yeah. been there. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I had a, and, and when you get out alone, particularly when you had an abundance of flying, all like a panel, you go out and a couple guys would get it on, you know. And uh, one of the most memorable days, you remember when the F 8 came back into the fleet, the Crusader? It's uh, about the day before Christmas, and I can't remember the year, but it probably was. Uh, probably was uh, 60 or 61 and I'm in a sky ray and I take off and I'm just going out for a couple of hours checking out some maintenance issues on the airplane and by myself and it's one of those beautiful California days when the contrails are everywhere and I head up the coast just gorgeous clear day and I look up over over uh, Edwards Air Force Base and up north of of LA and here they are the contrails yeah and they are getting it on and uh, so I just pointed my nose up there and I thought I'm gonna go up and see who this is so I went up there and there's an F-8 fight flying against a, it turned out to be an air guard out of Van Nuys F-86 and he is eating the F-8's lunch F-8's out of Miramar but he is just getting thrashed in this 86 pilot. Pretty soon the F-8 splits it off and leaves. So I pulled up alongside this F-86 guy and, and the old Sky Ray would turn with anything, I thought. So we start. And it probably took him two turns to saddle me in the six o'clock. And I did everything I knew how to do with that airplane. And he literally beat my brains out. He ran me out of gas too. And uh, we did everything you remember, rolling scissors and he. And when I got on the ground, we had some pretty distinctive pay jobs on our airplane. He knew who we were and I knew who he was. So he called me for a debrief. And he said, you know, son, you're not bad but you got a lot to learn. And I never forgot that. And he turns out to be a, a gray-haired Air Force Major, still in the guard, and I don't, I can't remember how many hundred combat missions he had in F-86s, but, and it taught me one lesson, that it isn't always the machine and the technology, it's the human. Yeah. And this guy was just better than I was, and he was certainly better than that F-8 pilot. So we talked about it, and I said, don't send any messages, don't do anything. And he said, I won't worry. He said, I know the situation, because that's totally illegal. Yeah. But I never forgot that. So we go back to starting Top Gun, and I remembered that day. And uh, all report came out, it was endorsed favorably came up through uh, Admiral Bush Bringle, who was ComNav Air Pack, Commander Naval Air Forces Pacific Fleet. He endorsed it. It came to Fighter Town at Miramar, and uh, the uh, commander of the fighter wing there, he endorsed it, and I was over leading the tactics group, doing ACM or, or dogfighting every day. We can fly at least twice, and uh, nothing but so I got called in, myself and a guy named Sam Leeds, and uh, Sam had been slated for the first F-14 squadron. This is, this is 1960-68. So they let me read the all report, and Sam and I, and Sam wanted his squadron, so he said, why don't you take it? And I thought, oh God, I can't think of anything more volatile to do than yeah. in the middle of a war trying to generate a, a graduate weapons school with the existing equipment you have. You know, you got to use the same airplanes and uh, and he got to get it out to the fleet in a hurry. So we listened and I read it and I said, eh, I'll try, but you know, I got to have, uh, got to have my pick of pilots 
and uh, I'm going to need some. I'm going to need some flak vests. In other words, <laughs> I and and and, and Admiral Briggle, and uh, I think it was Tex Canatzer, another famous guy in Miramar. Uh, we. Uh, they gave me the thing and they gave us a deadline of 60 days to put it together. 60 days. Develop a whole bunch of new new tactics with Phantoms. At Miramar? At Miramar. And we didn't have we didn't have offices. So I looked at them. I chose eight guys and an intel officer. Needed an intel officer. Had to get our hands on all the all the things that we had been locked out of by Washington all the MIG engagements. Why did we have a kill ratio so poor out there? All suggested a lot of things in there which we adopted. But we also went back, the intel officer and, a, and a, one of the original eight guys, pilots and backseaters with me, I got most of them right out of the rag that were flying tactics with me. You know, naval aviation in the fighter community is pretty small. It's like a Isn't Marine Corps. one or one? Huh? 121. 121. VF-121. So, yeah. And uh, so, you know, he said, the Admiral said, I'll give you whatever you need, but just do it. And, 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 you know, it doesn't take a wise man to realize you can't fail. When you're in that job, you have got to do it, and you've got to do it well. And uh, so, but when you, it's like running a business. When you have the assets and you get the support you need, you ought to be able to make it go, and we did. I broke up, a, and I had done some flying with the Israelis before that, and I learned from the Israelis to segment the various areas that needed to be improved, and uh, just a nice way of planning this thing. And now the Israelis, was that locally or over in Israel? Over here. Over here. Yeah. And uh, so anyhow, I'll make a long story short, uh, I brought in eight air crews and an intel officer and each one of these guys is a chapter in a book and they had some basic basic things we all had two combat tours in Nam. we all had uh, had done well probably as fine a pilots as I've ever flown with anywhere in the world and after we got rolling together they were probably Probably, with the exception of a couple of Israelis I know, were probably the best in the world. These guys were really good, and and they went, you know, they were uh, they were serious about it. Did any of these guys end up on that last cruise to Midway, Maine, where they got the uh, three yeah. three killed? Yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot of several of the students got one 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 of the students got one of those kills, and uh, Muggs McEwen who's on your airplane out here at the museum. He's in San Diego. And uh, he got two That's off of Midway, VF-161. Yeah, 161. And uh, Muggs McEwen and, and, uh, and uh, the great Deacon Cannell was a squadron commander in that group. And a uh, uh, young guy, his last name starts with V. He was in the last class at Top Gun, and he shot down the last meg of the war. And uh, they were on Midway with you guys. They have reproduced that on the military channel. Those fights. Yeah. Those guys were wonderful combat pilots. Oh. I mean, some of the things they pulled off yeah. were unbelievable. Well, we went at it. Once we got rolling, you know, you start out by analyzing the alt report. And uh, the guys all came voluntarily once I asked them. They all came voluntarily. Uh, Steve Smith, who had two combat cruisers, and just a great backseater. And he's the kind of guy, uh, as, a, as his leader, you could give him a list of things every morning, and by, by dark he'd have every one of them done. And uh, we, you know, the rag, the, the training rag, the basic F4 rag there at Miramar was going full boat during the war. They didn't have any room, and uh, they voluntarily gave us some airplanes to fly every day, and that's how we got started. But Steve Smith, I was telling you about him, he just, there's nothing you ask a guy he wouldn't do. He's just that good a human and smart man. He, uh, I called him in and the day I, we had our first meeting and I said, I want you to find a, a building. I said, I know where there's some 
Quonset Hudson. You probably have seen this old original billing. And I said, I want you to go get it. I don't want by by Monday morning. I want it back here. And if you can get it by Friday, that's even better. We'll clean it up and paint it over the weekend. So Friday afternoon, coming up the street is this maybe 60, 80 foot long building, Quonset Hut, under suspended under a big navy crane. And they hoisted it right up by the main hangar, the Phantom training hangar there, and they set it down right where I wanted it. And uh, I said, what did it cost, Steve? And he said, you don't want to know. <laughs> but he said they like adult beverages. <laughs> and he probably, he probably traded traded a, a case of scotch yeah, something for like that, that building yeah. and by Monday morning it was painted and uh, no no paperwork signed nothing and Monday morning we started working there so it was uh, you know it was a shoestring operation you know you had to take pilots out of the squadrons to get them into Top Gun yeah. how was that picked oh well the criteria was uh, in order to in order to take the new tactics and all the things we thought we were really going to the graduate school subject matter and with confidence and take it back out the fleet was to get the fleet squadrons to send in their best JOs. The criteria I laid out was they got to be USN, not training reserves or going to airlines. So we're talking uh, <coughs> um, lieutenants and below. Lieutenants and below captains and below in the Corps and we had a couple great Marines boy. Which which one? And, uh, you remember? The students. Do you uh, remember uh, their names right uh, Dave Vest mm -hmm. uh, from El Toro and uh, I flew with a famous Bear Lassiter. Would Bear get two MiGs? Yeah. And he ultimately got two MiGs and uh, God you could write a book about that man. Okay well we were talking about talking about Top Gun in the beginning with the all report and so forth and the original eight air crew and uh, I had the famous John Nash was one of the eight Johnny came out of an exchange tour flying F-111s with the Air Force oh, okay. and uh, and uh, he's a really was a specialist in air-to-ground employment of the Phantom besides that he's just absolutely fearless in the air and uh, and uh, he had been on Midway, I think, at one time was the squadron commander on Midway. And uh, but but John was young. We were all lieutenants. I was a senior guy as a lieutenant commander. I just <laughs> just made it in 1968 when we started. Oh boy! So uh, and I had Mel Holmes, who had been in and out of the service, had been to Nam twice, and uh, probably one of the best dog fighting people. And. Uh, he kind of took the segment of training for taking the Phantom as it was and expanding the envelope, the flight envelope that is. As you remember, the Phantom has an enormous amount of piece of this or specific power. So we had a lot of thrust to weight ratio. She was a beauty, but the wing wasn't a dog fighting wing. So, and, and, and given that it, it had so much power, it would accelerate in the horizontal very rapidly, and uh, that's that's got a downside to it because when you when you accelerate and get speed up for maneuverability, you've gone away from this little MIG sitting over here, so you lose sight of this. And anybody who loses sight consistently is going to die, or at least lose a battle. Yeah. So uh, so we kind of Mel just did a phenomenal job. And we started flying the airplane in the vertical. You could go up over the top, lay on the top, keep track of the fight. And uh, we took uh, we took uh, the tactics from the Second World War, the Battle of Coral Sea, of uh, two V one tactics, right out of the old history books. Not much new. And so we'd fly two airplanes, a mile and a half a beam of each other, being able to clear each other's six. And uh, Were you, Kurt? Yeah, you, know, you could cross. You could cross turn, and if this guy gets one on his tail, you just can turn back and engage. This guy goes up, and when this guy makes his pull off, if he does, if he can't get his shot, then the guy that's up here comes down. So you're really flying in an egg, and uh, 
we learned very rapidly through some later flying when we got the school just barely running, we got our hands on the, we got ability to fly the MiGs ourselves. So we validated all the tactics that Mel and, and the gang of guys put together. You validate them and uh, we flew the MiGs and, uh, and uh, we just, we made sure everything worked. Then you gotta train it, to, you gotta train the youngsters who are students to do the same thing. One of the biggest mistakes prior to Top Gun was uh, the, there was no real maneuvering envelope for Sparrow. In other words, your long range Sparrow guided missile shoot it over the horizon and hit a guy as he's coming at you. What we really didn't have was when you pass the merge and you're in a turning fight, there are ways we found out and a fellow named Jimmy Rulofson one of the brightest technical guys and a great aviator. And uh, he had flown wing with uh, an East Coast guy who had a great respect for him named Diego Hernandez, Duke Hernandez. And Jimmy learned a lot from him, but Jim had his own bag of tricks. And he worked with Raytheon and they redefined the firing envelope for Sparrow and Sidewinder. And uh, that's a hard thing to teach pilots because there's no, there's no red light come, or no firing light comes on it. You know, it's all visual and you're in a high G environment turning and the MiG's turning. So Jim did a phenomenal job. And you know, your kill ratio doesn't change unless those missiles work because we didn't have a gun again. So Jimmy Rillison worked on that. He worked with a factory, he worked with Raytheon. He worked with our own sailors, uh, the technicians, and uh, so he had a major success. So did Mel Holmes. We had, uh, I had uh, the pleasure of flying almost every day with the famous J.C. Smith, who was an NFO. J.C. probably he had he had naval aviator wings in the beginning, and he pulled a, a little un. Uh, prohibited stunt flying, and uh, and he didn't get out. They took his navy wings away from him and made him a NFO, which is, and so knowing JC, he he went out to combat in the beginning of the Vietnam War, and he and Lou Page, Commander Lou Page, they shot down the first wings of the war. So <laughs> JC got even with Washington and uh, later became a legend. What a wonderful guy he is. He just, and he was by far my best teacher. He had the ability to stand in front of a, a classroom. And uh, you know, you're not only teaching pilots who've been through flight training, but you're teaching new tactics. And uh, the guy in the back seat, he's gotta be as into it as the front seater is. And in many ways, it's more uncomfortable back there and, uh, but JC could build, he built confidence and egos in the young students. And uh, if I had a student in any way having problems, JC would climb in the back seat with him and straighten him out. And uh, just, just marvelous guy all around. And uh, had uh, Jerry Sawatsky, big Polish kid. Fearless, absolutely fearless in an airplane. And uh, he's a, I guess he had played a lot of football. He said, because he, no, no fear. And he would fly any time. Our routine day started at 4.30 in the morning, a brief, uh, usually an hour, hour and a half brief of students. And even in the, before the students got there, we, uh, we were starting that early and uh, we'd roll down the runway just at daylight and we quit at dark every day and then we go to the club and uh, and uh, critique talk about it talk about it and uh, Sawat was tremendous and uh, it wasn't much it wasn't very just a couple of weeks in the program he said you know we can't fight f4 against f4 we can't train like that what we got to do is we got to have some professional adversaries in other words you got to fly like the Soviets fly or like the North Vietnamese fly. By that time, we had been 
we had gotten access through the CIA of some critiques on the air engagements up there, Air Force and Navy. So we knew what we were, we knew what tactics we were up against. So we got our hands thanks to 121 skipper Captain Dick Schulte through his contacts in Washington got us eight, maybe ten A4Es. They were scheduled to be sold to some foreign country and they didn't want them. So we got them, we brought them out, we bolted the slats through, we took everything, everything weight-wise off of them that we could, bolted the leading edge slats, closed, and uh, we used those as MiG simulators. And it doesn't take long to, to learn how the Russians fly, no. And so they would fly the opposition against my students. And we used those initially to validate our new tactics. And, uh, Did they have much trouble finding them? See, what? Oh, they, of course. Yeah, that's like, small. They don't smoke. They don't smoke. And the Phantom, you and I know yeah. that the MiGs could see us coming eight, ten miles away by the smoke trail. Yeah. Which was which was unburned raw gasoline that that big, expansive engine really didn't totally uh, burn. Yeah. And uh, the only way you could get out of get out of smoke trails. So, we had a trick we did at 12 miles or so. A radar guy in the back seat would say, "Min burner," and we'd go into afterburner, minimum afterburner in the Phantom, just and just around the notch, just around the horn, just min burner, and it'd kick in, give you a little extra speed, which you really didn't need. But what it did was it got rid of your smoke trail. So at 12 miles, you could start maneuvering, doing whatever tactic that you wanted to do. And the MiGs were all of a sudden scratching their head, where in the hell they go? So anyhow, uh, that's now, who, who, who found that out? Huh? Who, who came up with that? Can you remember? Just, I don't know. Yeah, just knew you it. You know, it's just, it was, uh, there was never competition. That's one thing I didn't like about the movie. You know, the movie Top Gun, you know, the flying was pretty good. The flying in the picture was good, but there was never an ounce of competition among my guys. Yeah. As a leader, my number one concern in the beginning was these are big time egos, and these guys, every one of them can fly. And on a given day, they could whip each other. And, uh, and so he, I told them, I said, nobody gets hurt. You know, one accident, and somebody will put us out of business, and we'll all be down the tubes. So, and the guys really, we went accident free and we did some wild stuff with the airplanes. I, I devised a tactic, you know, we did, we're looking at offensive tactics and defensive tactics. So we started flying a lot in the vertical. And uh, one of the things we needed most was confidence in the airplane in the slow flight regime over the top or when you're doing a slow rolling scissors against the MiG. So, we, I said, we're going to do something. And I went up, Mill went up, and we get it going about 550 or so and just pull it right straight up, pure vertical, and hold it. Leave it in burner. Let her go up to zero airspeed. And let her tail slide. And there's no MIG in the world going to follow you through that. And it, But it gave me confidence in the airplane. I'd never done it before. I'd never spun the Phantom. So you go up, zero airspeed, you come down, you get some stalls, you know, bang, 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 but nothing. She starts tail sliding that big, big slab table at the stabilator, get, starts getting air to it, and she'll come right straight through, no ailerons, none of this. She comes sliding through like this, and she'll flop over on her belly, and she'll go right straight back down. And if that MIG didn't have the energy going up, when you flop through, you're going to either be past him or he's going to be below you. And you just hang what you got and let her accelerate. Follow and make out the bottom. And uh, we made every student do that. But how we did it was in the first part of the flight, we'd go up in the front seat, put the student in the back seat, even the pilot, the pilot aviator. Remember, there's no controls under a back seat. Oh, yeah. So we'd go up and demo it. And then we do some other stuff with the airplane uh, that he probably had never seen it do. And then we come back to the octagon, which is you can drive in a hot refueling place. You can drive in with the engines running, shut one engine down, and refuel the airplane without getting out of it. So we'd come and shut the left engine down, 
and we'd swap places and I'd get in the back seat with no flight controls and he'd put a JG in the front seat and say now I want you to go out and I want you to do exactly what we did in the front seat in the f first half of the hop so we go out and do it again now let me tell you something it's it's an awesome ride from the back seat with a nugget kid for the first time doing that and that big fan of and uh, but all you got to magic words are no ailerons, no ailerons, no ailerons, and that airplane will not misbehave. So, anyhow, that's kind of some of the stories. And uh, let's see, I got J.C. Smith, Mel Holmes, Jimmy Rulison, uh, Sawatsky, oh God, Johnny Nash, that's five, and uh, a guy named Mike Gunther. I got a silver star and I think a navy cross. Nash had a Nash had a silver star. I don't think he got a navy cross. But these guys had all had heavy combat before. Mike Gunther. Mike Gunther wasn't part of the original group, but he was always there willing to fly. He'd come in at 4:30 just to hear the briefs on his own time. And uh, he came from the A an A4 squadron down the street. And uh, and he was a very very good stick, and uh, again, every one of them pretty courageous guys. So they, they just he just blended in with them, and and we used him. And uh, how long did it take for you to start getting reports back on the change in kill ratios and the success? Well, of fighter. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Uh, Sixty days from the beginning. Our students came. They were handpicked from four fleet squadrons. They had to bring their own airplanes. We didn't have any airplanes other than the ones we borrowed from the mother squadron. So they come in and, uh, and the mother squadron maintained their airplanes the way they were here. And you ask a question about opposition to the program. Several of the fl fleet COs said, who in the hell are you to tell me that yeah. you can do it better than I can do it? That's my fighter squadron. My boys are ready. Well, we had a magic way of talking to them, and they came around. And and after the first class, the word got out. After the success of the first class, got out, and, and you know, it spread like wildfire among the fleet. What was going on here? And uh, and it got a lot easier. And pretty soon, by the selection of the second class. They were all calling in to Steve Smith, who was kind of the administrator and the coordinator for ops, and put out the flight schedules. And, and uh, we had guys fighting to come. And the Marines wanted to come, worst of all. And uh, so we just, we allocated them. And, you know, I never had a student I had to get rid of. Had to work with some of them. Who started taking credit for this? Because surely the people that are doing the job didn't get credit for it. Well, you know, the war is going on. Must be some admirals. It, 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 no, no. Really? No, you know what? You know what? It took time because of the moratorium, LBJ, and, you know, it shut down the air war over there. We're pumping, and it actually it was good because it gave us time. Every, every five weeks we had a class. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So we were able to get a nucleus of students graduated and we sent them back to their fleet squadrons with a stack of books, the new manuals that we'd written. That's something nobody realized. We actually developed them, intellectually developed the material, but we wrote the manuals. I mean, fighter pilots aren't known for writing. You know, but, uh, <laughs> but these guys wrote in their specialty areas. They wrote... Uh, so each section each was section, a chapter? And then we put it all together. In, in one and, book. And, and not just an academic. We had classes in the morning, and we'd fly in the afternoon till dark with students. And consequently, there was a flight syllabus, and there was an academic syllabus. There was a classified supplement for the weapon systems, how you employ the missiles. And uh, it was really neat because I never had to ask you know, naval officers and marine officers know how to keep their seniors informed. And uh, so, but I never had to ask permission. 
you know, you, you're kind of hanging it out anyhow. Yeah. So you're, the only thing that can happen if you screw it up is you're going you're gonna to get canned. 